This is the Sapphire X1950 XTX Toxic, one of the very first factory water-cooled GPUs, all the way back from 2006 and in Sapphire's own words. This was the fastest card on the planet. Today we'll first cover a bit about the history of the X1950 XTX GPU. Then we'll of course have a look at this card and even find out if it works, because at the moment I don't. There's a lot to cover, so let's get started. In 2006 there was a lot going on in the GPU world. AMD had just acquired video chip maker ATI, Windows Vista was in its beta stages and would offer exclusive support for the new DirectX 10 API, and multiple GPU setups with SLI or Crossfire were rapidly gaining popularity. And ATI and Nvidia were in a heated battle for the single GPU performance crown, with in the red team the X1900 XTX, and in the green team the GeForce 7800 GTX. And on average, the Radeon part was the better performer. It had higher core clock, higher memory clock, it had twice the VRAM, and its main advantage was that it was built on a newer process node, 90 nanometer compared to 110 nanometer. And Nvidia couldn't let this slide, so they worked on an updated version of the 7800 GTX the 7900 GTX. It was basically the same card as the 7800, but was now also built on the 90nm process. And Nvidia kept power at the same level, and in return they could boost core frequencies by a massive 50%, now also to 650MHz. Nvidia also doubled the GDDR3 memory, now to 512 megabyte, and depending on the media outlet, the effectiveness of these improvements ranged anywhere from a mere 5% extra performance in the case of a non-tech, all the way to a whopping 38% uh, in the case of hardware.info's tests. The bull was now back in ATI's side again, and with their upcoming HD 2900 XT still very far removed from launch, they had to get creative. So they took their X1900 XTX and bolted on some shiny new GDDR4 memory, clocked at 1 GHz, creating the X1950 XTX. This was one of the very few GPUs to ever use GDDR4 memory, and with this fast memory, ATI was back in the lead again, gaining anywhere from 4 to 11% better performance on average, um, compared to the 7900 GTX. So that was a brief overview of the story of the X1950 XTX GPU. Now to cover why this whole water cooling system is dangling off of this card. And for that we go back to before 2000, as it was around that era when chip scaling issues started to appear in the form of increased leakage currents. With every new process node it became more and more difficult to keep power and in return heat output in check all the while still wanting to keep increasing the clock speeds. And as a result, manufacturers had to become uh, increasingly creative in making more robust uh, ways of removing heat from these chips. We went from not even needing any form of cooling at all before 1995 or so, to a small passive heatsink, to a small heatsink with a fan, to a larger heatsink with a larger fan. And this eventually culminated in the infamous Dustbuster FX5800 Ultra from NVIDIA. And it was during this time that water cooling PC components had become more and more popular, as it was generally a more effective and quieter way of removing heat from the system. And during these years, around 2006 or so, Sapphire teamed up with Thermaltake, who already made all-in-one units for water cooling PC components. And they had a line of tight water all-in-one units for GPUs. And Thermaltake took the tight water mini, customized it a bit with their own decals, and created the X1900 XTX and X1950 XTX Toxic. If we first have a look at the card itself and then compare it to the reference X1950 XTX board, we can see that Sapphire used a basically unchanged reference card. The only changes they made are the individual heatsinks for the memory modules, and of course mounting a water block on the R580 chip. 
we can see that the fan header is still in place and that it has the same heatsink for the VRM modules and a standard 6 pin power connector. There's also an ATI Rage theater chip for composite video and for video connection there's dual DVI and S video. Turning it over, it's also the same reference PCB here, but we do have a special model sticker, noting that this is a toxic card. Moving on to the cooler, things are more interesting. Firstly, you'll note the Sapphire decals, and the fact that Sapphire didn't even bother to change the sticker for the X1950 model. Furthermore, we can see a glimpse of the copper radiator, the fan that pushes air through the radiator, and at the back a fill port for the reservoir and a small glimpse at the pump. In the reservoir you can still see some of the original green coolant Thermaltake used back in the day. On top there is the fan speed selector and power LED, and turning it over there is a quite nice anodized aluminum back and the sapphire logo. So what exactly made this card the fastest card on the planet? Well. Here we have the original press release from Sapphire from 2006, and it talks about a few aspects of this card, so let's have a look. The first thing it mentions is that, just like with the regular X1950, there were two variants of this card. We had the one I have, the Toxic X1950 XDX, and then there was also the limited edition Toxic Crossfire edition. And this had one DVI port less, but traded that in for the Crossfire port, back when you needed a real cable to connect two cards together. Secondly, getting to why this is the fastest card on the planet is that Sapphire shipped the Toxic X1950 with APE, the Automatic Performance Enhancer, which uplifted the core clock to 695 MHz. So basically, just like we saw earlier, this is a reference PCB that came with some software that automatically overclocked the card. Moving down, we can see some more information on the water cooling loop, we see that we have a pure copper water block and also a pure copper radiator. So that's very nice to have full copper uh, components. 12 volt mini pump and we have a transparent blue LED fan. And the two modes we saw earlier, one is 18 dBA at 2000 RPM, the other one is 26 dBA at 2500 RPM. And here we see that both the regular X1950 XTX and the Crossfire Edition had a stock engine clock of 650 MHz, so that was reference speeds, which was uplifted to 695 using the automatic performance enhancer. Well, it's time to find out if it actually works, and to be honest, I don't really have the greatest of confidence in this thing. I bought it sight and seen, and not only is it a 15-year-old GPU, but a water-cooled 15-year-old GPU, and who knows what has happened to it during all those years. I started out by adding water to the reservoir before trying to turn it on to see if there was any life in it. With the reservoir filled up, it was time for an initial test. Ooh, hello, there is some life in there. Okay. Yeah, we... Low high is working, we've got blue fans and... This is what I believe is a very loud pump we're hearing. In hindsight, I should have been a bit more cautious here, as while I could hear the pump running, I couldn't quite determine if the water was actually circulating. But as I was so happy to see any sign of life, I decided to test the card if it would also give an image. Will anything come up? Come on. Oh yes, we've got image, we've got image. While we are getting a great image, I don't think all is well with the card. May need to do it with the cooling system, as I can feel with my thumb that the card is, or that the chip at least, is putting out heat. But that heat is staying here within the water blocker. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the loop needed some attention. But it was fantastic news that the card appeared to be alive somewhat, albeit without drivers. Opening up the water cooling enclosure, we can see the tiny reservoir with some signs of gunk. Below that, the small 12 volt pump. And on the left, the small but full copper radiator. Very nice. I first removed the water block, which was a bit of a pain as Thermaltake used both spring clamps as well as glue. With the block off, I was able to use a syringe to try and push water through the system. With some effort, I was able to get some water through it. 
and as you can see the green coolant coming through. I continued to flush the loop and reconnected the power to the pump to see if it would, well, pump. There we go. There is a flow of water there. It's not perfect yet. And as more gunk freed up from the loop, the flow of water kept getting better and better. The water block was also thoroughly cleaned out and big chunks of green gunk were dislodged. I then reconnected the block and temporarily filled the loop with demineralized water. With the card somewhat reassembled, it was time to further test the GPU. Got the card installed, some precautions, don't think it'll leak, I've got some confidence in it, fingers crossed. Okay, so we are back in Windows and this is actually news the drivers have installed. And this is what we've been waiting for, the GPU Z readout. So far everything seemed good, the drivers installed fine. Water cooling loop was working, keeping the card around 45C at idle. And after some time running, more air got out of the loop, making it even quieter. And while I was able to play some glitchy Mafia 2 on it, it turned out there were two far more major issues. First, the car turned out to be very unstable. It would crash randomly both in games and on the Windows desktop sitting idle. Secondly, the card wasn't boosting to its full speed on both the core and memory. It appeared to be stuck in the clocks for the 2D mode, 506MHz core, 594MHz memory. But with the help of Twitter and Discord user Cybercat, we were able to flash another VBIOS onto the card. And that appeared to have solved the stability issue, but the problem of the low clock speeds persisted. And I tried just about every application to manually set the clocks, but to no avail. Until I tried the ATI Overdrive Automatic OC Utility, which keeps raising the frequency until the card crashes, to determine the maximum overclock. And somehow this was able to unlock the card into its 3D clocks again, and actually push it beyond to 660, 680, peaking at 695 MHz, the promised clocks of this toxic model. And even better, suddenly the card would also boost to its full frequencies in games again. And with everything now running quite fine, as you can see in the background here, it's now time to pull it apart again, to replace the demineralized water with some of this, some Aqua Computer DP Ultra Green. Not only because this has anti-corrosive properties, but also because from the factory, Thermaltake used green liquid, so I thought it would be fitting to put some green liquid back in it again. delicious. The first order of business was to flush the remaining demineralized water out of the system with the new coolant. You definitely want to do this in the kitchen or bathroom, as colored coolant like this can stain surfaces and clothes very easily. Once it was thoroughly flushed, the reservoir was filled up to the max, the pump was turned on to cycle the air through the loop, and then the reservoir was topped up again, and this was repeated a few times. And with that, the loop was up and running again. Now the only thing left was to apply some new thermal compound to the R580 die, and reassemble everything back together again.
the start of this video, my expectations for this car to actually be fully functional were really quite slim. And despite some issues and setbacks, look at it now, the result is there. We're running GTA 4 at the full 695 MHz and it's running fantastic against all odds. And overall it's just been great to bring back to life a card like this and to restore a bit of GPU history I'd say. If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and if you want to be kept up to date on future projects, why not consider subscribing to the Fully Buffered channel. In any case, I'd say I'm going to enjoy a bit of GTA 4 now I'd say. Where's the bowling alley?